we assume that it actually is paying increasing attention to this part of the world. And second, why it is doing using this sort of multilateral regional initiat initiatives. So these are the two things um, I would like to uh, tackle. Um, the problem is that mainstream IR theory don't really offer ready um, explanation of this, uh, of this kind of thing. So what I want to do is to present some theoretical framework. Again, I don't uh, pretend that my framework uh, will explain that and that you can use the framework to, um, um, to predict future development. What I want to do is to interpret what is going on. I think what is going on is a really complex thing as we saw from the, from the previous two presentations. So I hope you agree with me that already an interpretation which is a fair, fair goal already. And I'm going to use a way to logic for that. So now, um, this became also my passion. My wife thinks that I actually play more way chi than I should be working on my paper. Um, but it's a bit... Um, I started play way chi only about a year ago and it, with the idea was that I felt that, it, that there are some features in Chinese foreign policy which uh, you can understand better. Just so I know how deep I should go in way chi. Who knows the rules of way chi here? Very few, okay. And so, good. <laughs> so let me start with the China and Korea. It was mentioned before, so I'll just uh, underline what I want, uh, my main points. Uh, first three decades of PRC, uh, actually China did pay some attention to the developing world. But uh, the attention to the developing world um, was not singular. It, it actually had uh, more forms. Um, we have some legacy of uh, communist brotherhood, so to say. We have some legacy of Bandung, uh, peaceful coexistence, something which uh, created some goodwill in Africa, in Middle East, elsewhere. Um, but we also have uh, some legacy of uh, Chinese cultural revolution being exported, attempts to support uh, communist revolutions all over the place, especially in Southeast Asia, for instance, which on, on the contrary, created some uh, problematic sentiments which actually last all the way up to present. Mm. Then we have Deng Xiaoping, and we can say that actually during the, especially in the 80s, 90s, uh, as Professor Lee talked, uh, Tao Guang Yang Hui, uh, we had low profile peace and development, and actually China focused primarily on having good relations with the developed world. Developing countries were to some extent left, left behind at the time. Uh, from the perspective of Wei Qi, you can say that at that time China did not play Wei Qi uh, on the international, kind of the international game of Wei Qi. Now, um, what I would say is that starting from the year 2000, when the Forum of China-Africa cooperation was established, we are actually in the period we can start um, saying that this is the, the beginning of the the game for influence, so to say the global influence also following what Professor Lee was talking, Professor, Professor Leo. Um, so just go quickly, these are some of the regional initiatives which were established, starting 2000 with Africa, then the initiative with Portuguese speaking countries, Arab countries. This one is not much developed and very, very little known with Pacific Islands. Um, then 2011 and 2012, the initiative which I've been following last few years in Central Eastern Europe. Um, the last one was the, uh, the one with the Latin America Caribbean. The other road here is uh, special. On one hand, it's of course very different because it's not regional, but it's very, very much um, open. Um, so actually we can say all the other regions are somehow part of the other road right now, including Latin America, which even though don't really, doesn't really fit primarily into the idea of the other world, but is signing the memorandums now and so on. On the other hand, and that's interesting, many of the features of the other world can be actually find or found in all other initiatives. So I find this interesting. Um, in my, one of my previous projects, I dealt with the question of Chinese assertiveness, specifically in South China Sea, but in general. And um, 
Many scholars, I would say there is some kind of consensus that Chinese foreign policy has started to change, to be more proactive, sometimes in the end of Hu Jintao era, beginning of Xi Jinping. But actually looking from this, looking at this time, timeline, you can see that even at the end of Jiang Zemin, you would have some of the features which pretty much continue all the way uh, up to Xi Jinping. So from this perspective, Chinese foreign policy in the last 20 years look more uh, of a continual rather than kind of the clear shift uh, sometimes 10, 10 years ago. That's just uh, one thing. Um, this is a table which shows uh, visits of Chinese presidents from the year 93 up to present. Um, blue color show, uh, shows visit, uh, the vi visits to developed countries and orange color to developing countries. This is just to show you that indeed from 90s um, up to today, the share of visited developing countries is increasing. If we kind of put it <coughs> under precedence, you can see that for Jiang Zemin, it was about 50-50, developed countries, developing countries. For Xi Jinping, two-thirds of his visits go to developing countries. Now you would ask me what I count as developed developing. Of course, that's very contested. What I counted was North America, EU countries, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. That's basically developed. All the rest would be developing. I don't think we need to discuss now the labels. This is just very briefly to show you that indeed there is this process um, of growing attention being paid towards developing countries. So let me now move towards uh, IR theories interpretation. I should say that I don't try to pre present you new empirical material in my presentation. My idea is to, to show you how we can build a theoretical framework, so it should be more theoretical, conceptual, uh, what my contribution should be about. Um, as we said, mainstream the IR theories are not really sufficient. Um, realism, uh, is China trying to use Latin America, Africa as, an, as a kind of counterbalance of the US open alliance? Not entirely. Um, also, growing China's power, does it mean China wants to have, interact with them multilaterally? Well, it's not clear because, for instance, strong U.S. Um, had also acted uni uh, unilaterally. So, mm, from the perspective of liberalism, uh, are these institutions about economy or is it about something else? Professor Lee showed that actually there is a bit of economy, a bit of politics, a bit of something else. But it's really kind of a bit of a comprehensive animal. So the IR, uh, mainstream IR theories do not really offer, I think, very comprehensive explanation. This is, by the way, what Professor Song from Korea says and uh, argues in his paper. So there are not many papers, academic papers, which deals with the topic which, uh, which I, I'm talking to. When I, when I say that, I mean um, in a comparative perspective. There's, of course, lots of things written on China and Africa, perhaps a bit less on China and Latin America, but kind of the topic of looking at this whole feature of Chinese foreign policy from the kind of general perspective, there is not that much written over there. Professor Son uh, says, he kind of presents a very elegant theory from my perspective, and he says that China started to use these multilateral initiatives in the developing world because of its previous positive experience with multilateralism in East Asia. So that's what he would call cognitive feedback. And uh, he, he, he also mentioned the, the concept of reflective dragon, which I find very interesting because in the West, often China is regarded as a country which doesn't respond to, uh, to uh, stimulus. I totally disagree. I think China very much responds to what's going on, but it responds perhaps differently to what the Western IR theories would expect. So maybe that's where the problem, problem lies. Um, there are some, some others who uh, mentioned that these Chinese regional initiatives um, are experimenting soft balancing. Um, what I find interesting is Alda and Alves kind of develop perhaps um, some kind of arguments which Professor Lee was talking about, that by uh, China, by um, investing its effort into these initiatives, it is some, some, somehow building parallel international order. Um, with some, we may mention words like Tianxia is kind of 
new new Tientia 2.0, some, some kind of thing. So the idea is that um, if China is meeting with developing countries, they are being socialized. They, are be, they, they would accept China's norms, ways of doing business, politics, and so on and so on. Interestingly, our friend from, uh, from uh, Warsaw, um, Jakub Jakubowski, takes a bit opposite view, and he would say that not only developing countries are being socialized, but China actually is also being socialized by interacting with them, and that those developing countries are often capable of challenging China with these China self-created institutions, so that the socializing um, would go both ways. But this is very interesting, but I still don't think that this offers this comprehensive theoretical framework. I find that these, these ideas explain some specificities of this uh, Chinese uh, project, but, but, but don't really offer something which would uh, explain it in its entirety. Um, so there are some theories which can do it. Um, neo Gramscian theorem of hegemony, English school, for instance, uh, relation international theory by our friend uh, Professor uh, Kowalski, who is now in Ningbo. But however, what I'm going to do is I will uh, show you how Weiji can be used for that. Now, I'm not the first one using Weiji logic to interpret various things. There was very famous, well, I think it was very famous. I'm not sure you heard about the book by Scott Burman, uh, published in 69. And what he did was, he interpreted how communists won in Chinese civil war from the perspective of Wei Qi. Basically, he, he showed that communists played Wei Qi better than Kuomintang. Um, he was, for instance, showing how at the beginning of the civil war, Kuomintang controlled centers, cities, main communication lines, how communists started to encircle these lines, how they built bases in the village areas, how they played the protracted game. The book was called Protracted Game, that was the title. And that's one of the special feature, features of, uh, of Wei Qi. Very interestingly, from my perspective, Borman said at the end that you can apply Wei Qi logic to interpret Chinese foreign policy, but from his perspective in 69, he said China didn't start playing on the international board yet. So he said the game for global influence, so to say, hasn't started. So the title of my paper suggests that actually it does start, it started by now. Okay. Um, David Bly presented some uh, initial ideas about how Wei Qi can be used uh, to understand uh, Chinese foreign policy. Um, he kind of, I think his policy paper targets American audience and tries to tell them that you guys try to understand the perspective of the other side. Um, so he said that if you understand Wei Qi, you can really in significantly improve understanding of Chinese foreign policy. Um, he uses example for, exa examples from East Asia mainly, including Taiwan. Um, he also says that China building stadiums in Africa can be uh, seen as kind of one Wei Qi step that you are trying to uh, build your bases, you place your stones there. To, increase, to kind of increase the control, but he didn't really uh, develop it further. Henry Kissinger mentions Wei Qi uh, with regards to Vietnam. Our friend Jeremy Garlic mentions Wei Qi by interpreting Chinese policies in Pakistan, in Myanmar, these strings of pearls, kind of the idea, encirclement. Mark Moskowitz, for instance, discusses Chinese domestic societies from this perspective. Again, what I what, what I found is that uh, Wei Qi can really, is very, from my perspective, is very natural to interpret China in developing world and Chinese institutions, but I haven't noticed anyone doing it yet. So that's what, I, what I'm doing. Let me say a few words about Wei Qi, since you guys don't, don't, don't play it. Um, so Wei Qi means encirclement. Um, few features, which I will then use in my interpretation. Mm. When you play chess, most of the happening takes place in the center. With Wei Qi, at the beginning, you try to build secure bases in the corners, because that's the easiest where you can build secure base. And then, later on, you start expanding towards the center. Uh, Wei Qi is much more comprehensive than chess. In chess, most of the things is happening, there is one front line, most of the things is happening in the center. With Wei Qi, since you play the corners, you have four corners, then you have peripheries, 
So you can play on more front lines. So you have to decide which one you prioritize and so on. Then sometimes more front lines would join, sometimes they would get divided and so on. So in a way it's more complex, more comprehensive than, um, than chess. Um, compared to chess, chess has more, more um, you have, it's not stones, what is it called in chess? Pieces. Pieces. But they have more uh, different capabilities, right? The queen uh, has the most capability, you say pawn? Pawn. Pawn, the guy who is the weakest, right? In which way, all stones are the same. So it depends on your skills, on your strategy, strategies, that's what Wei Qi is about. So, um, for instance, David Light, he shows that American approach is very much uh, chess or maybe American football. It's about brute force, it's about capability. So he, he argues that Chinese approach is actually about strategy. He says China is now trying to build up its capability and what he argues is that America should work a bit more on its strategy. <laughs> That's what he says. Um, Wei Qi is protracted, takes much longer than chess. Um, it can happen in chess. If you make a big mis well, if you make a mistake, it's not so easy to reverse the game. Games is shorter. There is one front line. In which you can lose one corner. If you manage to win three more, you're on, you, you have the chance of winning the game. So if there is more up and downs in Wei Qi. It's longer. Um, <clears throat> Very interesting, and I think it was mentioned before. Uh, Wei Qi is about relative victory and loss. In chess, you either win, lose, or there's draw. Three possible outcomes. You have these three possible outcomes in Wei Qi, but you can win with the difference of 0.1 point, which is really almost draw, but you're the winner, but you're a relative winner. Very, it doesn't happen very often that a winner would win entirely, right? So what Borman says, kind of Chinese communists managed to control all mainland China after the civil war, but in Wei Qi, most of the time, that doesn't happen. If two opponents play who have kind of similar skills, almost always you manage to secure at least some area. And that's, that's another very important thing. That, uh, as was mentioned, once you build a secure area, uh, fully secure area, there is no way the opponent can kill this area. What you then can do is you expand this secure area to the center, and then you it, it, it gets it gets kind of um, well connected. On the other hand, sometimes you have an area which is under your influence, but then this influence can shift. Sometimes you can have stones positions which seem they are dead, but with the game developing, it can actually appear can turn out that they are not dead and they can come back to life. So there, there, there are these kind of, it's a very fluid development over there. Okay, let me now show you how this game can be applied to interpret these Chinese regional initiatives. I will first talk generally, then I will show you specifically China and Central Eastern Europe to show you some kind of a bit even more specific uh, cases. My main argument is that as, um, that uh, Chinese, the regional initiatives in the developing world, um, kind of the main similarity with Wei Qi is to focus on periphery, first of all. Firstly, we have of course geographical periphery of the international order. That would be the developing, the developing region. But, so secondly, focus on institutions, and by, by these, I don't mean only uh, formal institutions, but also informal institutions. Uh, this is also a marginal area in the international order from the functional perspective. In my paper, I also show that that's really very much in line with how uh, Cox and Ramsey treat theory, what was mentioned by Professor Lee. But the, in a way, uh, if someone wants to um, conduct a counter-hegemony attack on the international order, it might help if you start building your support base in the developing world and with uh, with the new in, in international institutions, both formal and informal. Uh, when it comes to encirclement, comprehensive approach, uh, I think it's quite obvious these institutions are not only about economy, they are not only about politics, they are not only about people-to-people -people relations, it's a bit about everything. As Professor Lee, Lee, Lee said, is Belt and Road economic initiative? China says yes, we also would say yes, but there is this but. And by the way, this is the reason how I came to the whole idea of Wei Qi. 
And I think that the idea can bridge a lot of contradictions which I saw previously. The which you would say it is a bit of everything and it would give some kind of clear, um, clear, clear framework what is going on. What's going on is China plays the stones and we will see later on how these stones can be used. Maybe some of these stones will be killed in the way term terminology. Maybe some will, uh, will seem to be kind of unimportant or dead for, for years or decades, but then later on it will appear to be alive. So for instance, the railway in Tanzania. Right? China built it when? In the 60s? Then maybe in the 80s, 90s it didn't play any role. Today it does play a role, right? Because it produced quite some goodwill and so on. So from this perspective, we may say that, okay, maybe one or two Chinese projects or, you know, Confucius Institute or something is a waste of energy, waste of money, but maybe it will produce position which can be used later on. Okay, so this is kind of my personal, my personal path, how I got into this understanding. Uh, coexistence. So this is interesting. Um, again, in line with, uh, with Cox and Gramsci. Uh, Chinese regional institutions don't mean attack on hegemonic uh, international order. It's not a direct attack, at least. So, uh, many in Western Europe are uh, nervous that China is undermining its influence, that it wants to divide and rule. China says we don't want to divide and rule because we like United Europe as a counterbalance. So, I think way to logic, again, can show that on one hand, China is not directly attacking because Wei Qi allows for coexistence, for secure, um, secure existence of the other side. On the other hand, you are building influence in a new era, so you will inevitably push the other side, at least a little bit outside of certain area. So on the, from that perspective, there is some ground for, uh, for being nervous on the side of the EU, the US, and so on. Um, so since you don't play Wei Qi, um, if you have players which are not at the same skills, what you do with Wei Qi is that the player who is uh, weaker gets, gets a few stones to start with over there. So for instance, when I played last week with one very good player, he told me I can put six stones over there, right? Then he beat me badly. Because he knew how to play, but I got the advantage. From this perspective, this is, by the way, what Bormann says about Guomindan. That Guomindan had stones on the board, then communists came and played the game so well that they managed to win the whole control over the mainland. From this perspective, we can see China as a, um, as a player who's entering the game and the opponent has already stones there. So China must avoid having direct fight early on, because it would reveal its weakness. Again, that's something which Gramsci would say. Uh, so China would play a little bit here, a little bit there, slowly building up its presence, and then, maybe at one point, when it thinks that, okay, I'm strong enough here, maybe in Africa, I don't know, then maybe we can move on towards some, somewhat of a more open, in way to terminology, hostility. Uh, the US response, how we can interpret that? Uh, so, if, if, uh, if someone who is not very skilled Wei Qi player respond, so you play here, and that player would immediately play just next to it. A good Wei Qi player would look at it, think, maybe you will see that I don't have to play there because I can play a better move somewhere else. And also, normally you don't play just next to the other stone, you have to play a little bit, little bit uh, further, because then you can be surrounded very easily. From this perspective, for instance, I suggest that what the U.S. is doing now in Africa uh, is that China is present there, the U.S. now travels all over Africa and says how Chinese approach is bad, but then I will be listening to many Africans that they say, we know the problems of Chinese approach, but if you don't give us a better alternative, you know, this is still the best alternative we have. So I think this is, this is something uh, which the U.S. sometimes does that it, it overreacts without creating the support basis, right? So from this perspective, if you criticize Belt and Road for, for offering bad investment, then it's not enough just criticizing it. You need to offer a better alternative. I'm just suggesting this will be one, one way how to see the situation from way to logic. Actually, it was 2017. Uh, Xi Jinping said one interesting thing. 
which really fits in wave logic, and that is that China is moving to the center stage of the world. So, from my perspective, this would mean first phase is over, we are moving now to the second phase already. <clears throat> okay, let me go quickly through the China CEE before I conclude. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not choosing CE as a case study because it's representative. Quite the opposite. CE is quite a problematic case in all this situation. And by showing some of the challenges China is meeting there, I can uh, emphasize better some of the weighty features. So first of all, CE is not really developing world, so to say. Uh, or is it? For instance, Okay, let me, let me leave it aside. But at least most of the countries in the Czech Republic, we don't think of ourselves as a developing world. We don't think of ourselves as being global south. Vantec published the paper about this, by the way, as well. Uh, when China would say to see that this is south-south cooperation, we're like, yeah, but you know, we're not, we don't really think this is a south-south cooperation. Uh, we don't really have good memories, most of us in see of communism, um, of we don't have any third world, third world sympathies, which probably many in Africa would have with China. And what, we, what is even more important, the year 1989 sets Central Europe and China really at two different directions. For us right now, we celebrate 30th anniversary of Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, how we regained our freedom. We know what happened in China in 1989. It's very difficult to build some kind of sympathies uh, based on this, uh, on this uh, history. So Chinese leaders would often talk about traditional friendship with Central Eastern Europe, but it's not very much reciprocated on the other side. Nonetheless, Central Eastern Europe started to be relatively excited about China after global financial crisis. Because economically speaking, the region was very much dependent on the Western Europe. And with crisis in, investment decreased, uh, demand for our products decreased, and many people started to look for economic alternatives. And China seemed to be like an obvious, obvious choice for this economic alternative. However, a few years on, the situation is very much mixed. So the situation of of 16 plus 1 platform, China CE relation is hot politics called economics. Trade did increase, but very little, and most of the increase was on the side of Chinese exports. So it's actually worsening the trade relations. Poland, for instance, have quite big bal trade balance. It's a big problematic issue over there. All the CE countries have big trade uh, deficits with China. Uh, many more Chinese investments were uh, expected in the region. That didn't happen. There was really big gap between high expectations and reality, which then led to the disappointment. Western Europe, as was mentioned, has been quite suspicious of what China is doing. And, uh, and in fact, many of Chinese uh, policies could not even be implemented in Central Eastern Europe because uh, we have to do public tenders. When we are building highway, you don't, we don't do state-to-state -state deal like African or Latin American countries do. So that, that, that was not something which China uh, managed to solve. So China didn't really manage to adjust its offer. So the offer in Central Eastern Europe is really very similar to the offer in Africa, Latin America. And in this way, it's only applicable to the five non-EU members from the whole 16 or 17 countries. Uh, Finally, uh, since last year, there are even growing, uh, growing controversies. In the situation of little economic results, in the situation of this problematic historical past, uh, in the situation of growing suspicions, then when the whole case of Huawei came, uh, Czech Republic and Poland actually became some of the strongest opponents of Huawei. So there were some, uh, some steps which I can go in detail. And so on. However, so now we are really in a situation that most of CE um, is not very much is not excited about China anymore. With probably two only exceptions being Serbia and Hungary. All others are kind of disappointed, not really excited about that. How to interpret this from wage perspective? Chinese moves in CE were not so efficient as elsewhere. Why? Because we have different contexts, and Chinese moves or steps were probably not placed that well. Maybe they were the same as elsewhere, but the context was different. 
which is again something with which you can, um, can help you to interpret. The political moves uh, were, not, were not efficient because of lack of common ground growing suspicions. Economic moves, lack of results. People to people